Thank you, Phil, for hosting. This is wonderful. I feel honored to be here. Um, my latest poetry collection is called Lust, and typically I do talk about love, lust, and happiness. But since it's 9-11 and I am a former New Yorker, I am going to start a little bit in the dark side, but I will lead you to the bright side. Um, I'm a very positive thinker, but I'm also a hippie child of the 60s, and I'm very anti-war, anti-guns. And so uh, when 9-11 happened, I was very affected, like most of us. Um, and so I wrote a poem, because about that time, my nephew was admitted to uh, West Point Academy, and he was going to go off to war. And so I wrote a poem um, that's being published in River's Edge next month, and it's called Why I Hate Guns. I hope there are no pro-war people here, <laughs> but this is California, right? It's kind of safe, right? <laughs> yeah, you can hold on for the lust part. Yeah. <laughs> um, why I hate guns. Yesterday, across my television screen, far-flung pellets and bodies launched like rockets into an abandoned field of hidden soldiers as body parts sprinkled midnight quarters. Be faces on adult bodies lurk in distant places. Far from confused brides laden with blossomed bellies and cryptic kids screaming in hidden parks. Those decorated with unknown futures as holsters hang loose, weighed down by hollow revolvers, beside stomachs pushed against sandy fields. Familiar fellows there have done the same, like my daughter's friend, years in Afghanistan and this many moons later, still awakens tormented during the night and mornings, haunted by imaginary figures tucked around city corners grasping memories of service, which left him with a handicap no pill or time can erase. Today, a tear lands on my aged cheek to yesterday's vision, my 18-year-old nephew who has chosen a parallel life, off to military college with a Ziploc bag of toiletries doned in green and black, photos camouflaged in spiny bushes, as I wonder if he'll ever return, or even remember our Saturday zoo visits, and our laughs beside the South exhibit of the sloth that loved hanging upside down. Those memories just seem trivial as he clicks his heels and loads that revolver to snap to the snap of a politician's whim who chooses death over life in the name of false freedom. Now he's on the battlefields because he graduated, and uh, he's a ranger, so we just keep our fingers crossed. Since we're in a library, I'm going to read my poem called The Library. I spent a lot of time in libraries. I love libraries. I hope they're around for a long time. There are days I kind of wonder about that. The Library. Buried in the happy moments of my childhood, sits a public library nestled between a department store and a post office, the only place that I could find peace in a home full of yelling and screaming and the fallout shelters at school, in that little library card bearing my name underneath the lamination which would protect me like the words of my father who took me on his lap and swore that everything would be okay because in the end, books would save me. And knowledge is the only thing that could never be stolen away. OK, um, Lust. Um, this collection was released on Valentine's Day appropriately. Um, and I'll start with a poem called The Visitor. You come into the night to whisper your kindness into my sleeping ears. As you hypnotize me with your eyes, your voice, and your ways. You rip me from a seamless sleep as you rustle about my rose garden. Put me in a tizzy, and then you suddenly leave. 
Your online words are coated with warm tea. When you visit, your limp handshake holds unanswered questions. While the observer in you pulls feelings out of a bucket. My shyness, confusion, and fear capture every inch of me. Here we go. Lust. If you know lust, like I know lust, you know how it grabs you in places that feel so good in a way that trumps tomorrow. It snatches and strangles our pasts away and forages unforbidden, unforbidden futures while injecting needles of pure pleasure into every artery receptive for its dose. The more you get, the more you want. As you climb the hill to survival, to the job which pays the bills and fills your dinner plates. When not gasping for pleasure, the door swings open on your far side of town, where the boars reside in boxes stacked upon splintered shelves that your parents have created. As your independent spirit branches out to seek life's rare erotic pleasures found inside the scrotum and fallopian tubes of hidden channels of love, buried in blissful tunnels until the cell phone rings and snaps you back into reality, the one which you crave to leave, in a giant step back to the future of the timeless, lustful tunnel of love. Do you remember as clearly as yesterday's star the moment our eyes linked on that beach in the midst of heaven when we realized we were really supposed to be where we were and every soldier was in its proper place and every shoe lined up in the closet of time and every crystal and kernel of sand glistened under its quarter moon where you felt you could walk on water without being called God and offer hope to anybody needing it, all because she walked into your life and emptied it. Reading at the Cobalt Cafe, I don't know if anyone's ever been there. Yeah, I mean, Rick and I read at, um, actually he's reading also for the Leonard Cohen thing, and uh, so he asked me to read there, and he said, oh, you have to pick a poem for broadside. I'm like, oh, I hate picking my own poems. Can you just pick? He said, no. <laughs> so this is the one I picked because I figure, cre um, I write a lot about creativity because I think that inspires us. So this is called Create. Make me the person I want to become. Draw for me the secrets buried under the facade of responsibilities. Allow me to be who I want as I whisper secrets into the pockets of your open mind and the doorways to your heart. Make me the one you wake up to every morning, the coffee that brews you, the ice cream which smothers you. Steal my heart and hold it with your sculpted muscles. Massage it as if you want to keep it forever. But most important, please don't tell anyone of the little secret of the person we will become together. I thought I'd mix it up and pick out some from my first poetry collection. Um, Anna Eastney was a big inspiration for me, so I dedicated this book of poetry to her. It's called Dear Anna East. Um, and it's called In My Imaginary World, because I think as poets we all have very vivid imaginations. Mine are often at cafes or behind closed doors, so. My imaginary world. People drip with, drip with stories and linger in bookstores and cafes, slurping foamy cappuccinos and nibbling on chocolate cake. Or creme caramel, flipping through their latest writings while jotting down notes in their notebooks. In my imaginary world, people have antennas to feel what others feel, to be there when needed and disappear when it's just time. In my imaginary world, poems don't need editing and writers are never rejected. <laughs> in my imaginary world, friends last a lifetime, keep in touch and nurture us with memories of love. In my imaginary world, kids have lots of kids to swell the universe with giggles and questions. 
Dogs never die. And lovers understand that when it's over, it's over. <laughs> In my imaginary world, we become someone else, maybe for a minute, an hour, or a day. Sometimes wishing for an eternity. But the real solace comes in the quality of being different for just a short time. It is the challenge of the perspective which is most welcome to us. So I can do funny or serious. I used to have um, like red tabs for the really hot ones and then like green ones for the like PG and I would usually ask like what color and everyone, red! <laughs> so, any preferences? Red. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and read. Read and read. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> okay. It's the color of lust. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's interesting because the next poem I'm going to read, um, I read it my first reading at the Granada, and some of you were there. Um, Barry Spax, the p first poet lord of Santa Barbara, who's passed away early this year. We all miss him, but he. This was the last book he blurbed, and I feel very honored. And I. It was. He had. Um, I read at a reading before he passed away, and I said, "I'm so nervous." Which, I don't know which poem to read, and this is the poem he picked, and it's called Seduction. Seduction. I gotta use a fan for this one. You never said a word, you never made a nuanced gesture, or took my hand to tell me that you wanted me. You never wrote me a love letter, or said you couldn't wait until we met again. You never bought me a present or said that you never met anybody like me or that you will miss me during your month-long travel or that one day you knew our paths would cross again. But today, you could not put your finger on it. There were so many things that you knew without telling me because I could feel the pulse through the deep look into my green eyes and the way you seduced the dormant woman in me who had been living dead for so many years. Recommended by Barry Spax. May he rest in peace. He also was the officiant at my, wed at my daughter's wedding and also Stephen and Melinda's wedding, and I was there. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing. To have a poet officiate at your wedding is spectacular. It's just like, it doesn't get any better, I don't think. And thanks for giving me that idea. If I hadn't been to your wedding, I would have known to ask him. Okay, so my morphine. Seeing you, I've never done morphine, by the way. But seeing you, touching you, kissing you is the morphine which I love and hate. It is a cure for my wounds anchored in my psyche, the confusing package I inhabit. When you are far away, being without you comes easy. But like morphine, the more I lay my eyes on you, the more I want you, need you, crave you. One might say that one day my addiction will kill me. But my hope is that you shall never use this power against me. Or that like an overdose, I may spasmodically fall to the ground in a place distant from the warmth of your heart, caressing my warm arms. The lighter one, short, called pickup, not truck. Took a while. Yeah, it took me a while to um, pick up. It wasn't your offer or the way you said it. It wasn't the way you did it or how you made me feel. It wasn't the time of day, or the shape of the moon caressing us, or how you smiled when the sun rose. It wasn't the traffic that zipped by in the freeway, or how you said goodbye. It was just the way you loved me and cared enough to ask. Um, I think a lot of, we were talking before about the 60s, so this poem is called what is it called? It is called Sexual Revolution and, Re and Evolution. I think of you know, the Beatles whenever I read this because of the revolution song, so. 
Um, and I was a rebel. We saw Hair a few weeks ago in LA, and that was really nostalgic. That was fun, because I saw the first one on Broadway in 67. I was like, wow, this is, and they all got nude on stage. I couldn't believe it. I'm like, whoa, this is pretty cool. Of course, they all went on, they had like a white sheet on top of that, of like surrounding, they were getting undressed, and they had the white sheet, and they pulled the white sheet up, and you saw the nude bodies, and you had about five seconds to glance at five bodies, and there were so many great ones. Like, wait a minute, I'm not finished. <laughs> And they put the sheet back down, like, oh, darn. <laughs> and it started raining. I couldn't believe it. You know, it was at the Hollywood Bowl. It was, it was the first time I was ever there. It was phenomenal. But yeah, the nudity on stage in 2014. I was kind of surprised, but pretty, pretty only in LA. Yeah, cool. Uh, sexual revolution and evolution. When I was young and desirable, I looked to you for enlightenment for freedom from my obsessions with sensuality and sexuality. But now, sunk into middle age, the pulse of my memory sustains like the morning coffee that you served as I rolled over to see the smiling face. And I'm reminded about how you used to always wake up hard in the morning inside of me. <coughs> Out of the corner of my eye on your wooden table, there sits a little blue pill, which executes its magic of blissful journeys accompanied by runny noses and transports to forgotten youths of reading erotic poems and glimpsing at bad pornography. This seems to be the only way when there are no other offerings other than your tight jeans, which remind me of all that once was. Beside my leather miniskirt, which you ever so slowly lifted when our kids were small and time was scarce. <laughs> my kid, anyway. As I stood over gas stoves, stirring, simmering soups, rocking babies and carriages in one hand and spoon in the other, hands tied and submissive, just the way you like me, and just the way I wish it were now. Oh, a touch of enlightenment. I gave a reading at Babeland in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, and I never gave a reading at a sex toy stop, but my publicist put me there. I'm like, oh, you gotta be kidding. Anyway, my daughter lives down there, and so she came. I was like, okay, here we go. <laughs> this is your mom. <laughs> Imagination, of course. <laughs> Woo, it was fun. How am I doing? I'm Okay, because um, I had just a couple of more short ones um, that would work. Okay, like really short. Whoops. Um, well, let's see. Found. The day my first story came to me, I started smelling roses around you and suffocated in my own delight. Friends do not meet one another. They knew each other from the very beginning. And my last poem. Where else? Where else but in art can you let your fantasies blossom and dreams flower? Nowhere. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>